off by about, I don't know, I can't remember how much time that 10 degrees represented. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay, 10 minutes. Kept coming off 10 minutes, they couldn't figure it out. Running it through their greatest minds that they had, they couldn't figure it out. Finally, somebody remembered this story in the Bible. <laughs> and they put that calculation in and everything came right together. So that's how true that story alone is. So if, if God can move the sun back 10 minutes, he can do anything else. So just to strengthen our, you know, faith in the word. I mean, that, that just felt like the Lord wanted me to, to share that little story here today. So Lord, we just are so thankful, Lord, that everything about you is truth. No matter what we read, if we try to figure it out, Lord, we're just fooling ourselves because you're able to do everything and anything. Anyone who can speak a word and create the heavens and the earth and everything in it, then I imagine 10 minutes moving that sun back is nothing to you. So Lord, we just come together tonight, increase our faith, Holy Spirit, build our faith and anoint us, Holy Spirit, to never ever doubt our Lord and any, everything that he can do and everything he wants to do. We just invite you now tonight, Holy Spirit, come, come, Father God, send forth your spirit here tonight is such a heavy manifest presence yes, yes. that that we just experience all that you have for us and that we just are enveloped in your love here tonight lord jesus we say come and have your seat that we have for you here tonight lord jesus come and take the seat of honor here tonight because you lord it's all about you this isn't about anything to do with us, but we're here to honor you. So we just worship you and thank you, Lord, as we sing our praises tonight. May the angels join in with us here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs>
you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. For the pulling down of strongholds. For the pulling down of strongholds. Do you believe that tonight? Amen. Then let's sing.
that you will allow me to push my winds upon you, that you would not go against my winds, but you would allow the winds of my spirit to propel you forward to my kingdom work. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yes,
after Jesus. We want you, our heavenly bridegroom. We want you, sweet master. We want you, precious Lord. We don't want religion, Father. We want you. just so excited about what God is going to do. We're never in a hurry here. We make room for God to move, and I can't wait to hear from Pastor Dan here in just a moment. We're going to give a couple of quick announcements. I'm going to hand it over to Pastor Ron for our offering, and then I'm going to introduce our special pastor here tonight. Our conference flyers are in. Hallelujah. Coming up, May 3rd through the 5th, Running after God. How many people are running after God? Yeah. You want to run after the Lord. Our spring, Refuge Ministry Spring Conference. 
And uh, we have quite a few speakers coming in. Pastors Dan and Joan B.A., Pastors Jay Francis, Stephen Terry Jones, Dad Porter, Grace Stone, Stephanie Ribbis, Hallelujah, Stephen Terry Jones. It's going to be awesome. So if you're watching right now, book your rooms now because the best Western hotel in Palmyra always books up fast and that's the best place to go. It's the closest place to us and have the best rates. But if it is booked up, have no worries. You'll have to drive a little bit further to Geneva or Farmington, but you will find a room. But it's time to start booking your rooms. Amen. If you'd like to have some flyers or posters to put up in different churches or different places or cards, we have them right here in the front, here on the altar part. We also have some in the back over there by the Oasis sign, and you can grab a hold of those. Hallelujah. Pray for my dad, Dad Porter. Um, the doctors feel like he would do better by being admitted into Strong, so he gets admitted tomorrow. And uh, he goes through some pretty um, heavy-duty uh, treatment for his cancer. This is his last attempt to try to get rid of this. We believe in the healing power of God, of course, but he's going to try one more thing. And uh, he's been getting treatments thus far and many blood transfusions, but he has uh, turned into leukemia, full-blown leukemia now. So this is going to either save his life or... Jesus is going to perform an awesome miracle, Amen. or he's going to graduate to heaven, one of the three. And so I'm praying that God would just intervene yes. as the yes. doctors are with him. Pray for him. Today is the, exactly February 18th is the second anniversary of my mom's homecoming to heaven. And so it was kind of a tough day for us in our house today. And, uh, and then that mixed with um, him being admitted for up to four weeks, leaving the comfort of his own home. I've been driving up to Rochester, doing all these treatments and many, 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 many doctor's appointments, blood transfusions that last four hours long and all of these things. And now he's being admitted. So his world is being changed a lot. Okay. So I'm just saying, please pray for him. I would appreciate that. And uh, if you live up in that area, you want to pop in sometime during the month, pop in to Strong's and uh, say hello to him. I'm sure he would love to see you. Amen? Brother Ron, are you ready, my brother, from another mother? <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. We have the opportunity to invest uh, in this place and the upcoming conference and uh, in the lives of others. Um, as I was driving here, the word that came to me, or words, I guess, there is more. There is more. And I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but um, that, to me, I first heard it, I'd like to say I coined the phrase, pat myself on the back, but in the last, probably the last 10, 15 years, a little very unassuming guy down in Pennsylvania, um, long ago, he went out to the Baptist Seminary, and he was there, I don't remember how long he was there, but a strange thing happened to him in his prayer closet. He was talking in a language he did not understand. And that definitely messed up his future. There. Um, at this Baptist seminary, he was given the right foot of fellowship. He couldn't be there anymore because he had discovered tongues. This, this unassuming guy went on to uh, start a school of supernatural ministry. And it's more or less like the East Coast version of Bethel out in uh, Redding, California. And he's even got a book, and that's what it's called, There Is More. Mm. Um, what does that mean to us? What does that mean to us? At some point in our lives, the folks that are here, if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, someone got a message across to you that may have been, you know, John 3.16, Revelation 3.20, John 3.3, whatever it was that captured your heart, you took a step. 
and you stepped into a realm, and at that time, it's like, what am I getting into? You know, and, and we begin this lifelong adventure, whether we've been at it for a week, a year, a decade, a bunch of decades. It's, it's, it's like it never ends. We're on this adventure to get closer to him. And as we do, we discover there is more. At first, we're born again. We're in the kingdom. We're going to go to heaven when it all ends. But there is more. There is an entire world out there that is hurting. And each of us are given gifts to discover, to, to use, to help others find the kingdom that we found. I, I don't know what each of us has, whether it's healing, evangelism, deliverance, but I guess the reason that word came to me is it's just run after him, pursue, you know. Uh, we'll find him when we seek him with all our heart. He will show us what that gift is. And if he can show me, who's a little bit stubborn, <laughs> um, I'm sure he will show you. And we can take it out. And we can change the world. We can change the world, because there are a ton of broken people out there. Hurting, they suffer from anxiety, depression, addiction, um, poor relationships, poor upbringing, which causes them to do all kinds of crazy things. So we have a job to do. Pursue him, and pursue them. What I'd like to do right now is take a moment to pray uh, for Dad Porter. Um, if you all Pray with me in agreement. Father, we thank you for this man of God that you brought into our lives. It has been a wonderful experience to get to know him, to get to love him. It breaks our heart. It breaks our heart to see him hurting, to see him down. And we lift him up to you, Lord. We lift him up to you. We know you've got a plan. But out of selfishness, we pray Cancer, go in Jesus' name. I curse you. I command you to die, shrivel up, and be expulsed from that body. That the red cells, the white cells, the bone marrow would all be regenerated and restored. Better than it's ever been. And he would be totally healed. And he would rock the world of each and every one of those doctors. He would be the buzz of that hospital. They would have no explanation except it must be you. That is our prayer, Lord. That is our prayer. It's our heart. We pray healing in the Wayne Porter in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, not long ago, I was at a, a funeral for Brother Dan. Some of you remember him because he used to come here on Sunday nights. And I heard a, a beautiful testimony, just a fragment of it. And I, I saw a new pastor in the area, Pastor Dan Nilsson. And when I heard his testimony, my heart leaped on the inside. And I knew that he was to come here on a Sunday night and bless us with his testimony or whatever the Lord lays on his heart. I felt like there was much more that he had to share than what he had the opportunity to do in that setting. And when we talked on the phone for the very first time, I immediately felt a connection with him. And we had some things in common that I had absolutely no clue about until someone told me. And then when I talked to him on the phone, if you've heard me speak very often, you know I talk about Walter Butler all the time. I mention him all the time. Well, Pastor Dan knew Walter Butler. And his father and him was in his home. And uh, he was telling me some stories, and it was just amazing. I'm like, that's such a hero of the faith for me, Walter Butler. And he knows Walter Butler personally. And so I found a new friend, another brother from another mother. And so I welcome Pastor Dan to come and share his heart right now. And uh, why don't we give him a new work, new work, welcome. Hand 
real quick. Yeah. I don't want that to go for a ride. I asked if we could just do one song. I know you stood for a while. Would you stand again? Oh, yeah. If you don't know the words to it, it's very simple. What do you have for a key? just to say, Lord, could you just sit back for a minute and let us bless you? Could we just bless you for a minute? Can we just bless him for a minute? We sing about his power. We sing about all the goodness of God. But sometimes in the morning I'll get up and I'll say, Lord, can I just take a few minutes and bless you? Can I, can I just take a minute and bless you? Worthy is the name. share it along these lines. I just sense it inside. Come on. This is a little out of character for me.
sip, let it arise. Come on. Come on. But praise arise right now. take her through. There is nothing that I will not do or pour upon her in blessing and love, for I love my bride, and I will move through those who seek my face. For I am the living God who does what I have accomplished to do. For I am him who sits upon the throne, and I will use my bride, and my bride shall go forth in my love, in my name, and my power, worshiping me and looking into my eyes gazing upon me and walking in victory in the victory that I am for I am the living one that is ever living and none can depose me none can stop my move and none shall stop my move through my bride you could sense what's going on here right now.
still standing. <laughs> I'm having trouble. <laughs> My legs are weak anyway, but uh, I'm having trouble. Um, I might at some point need a stool just to sit down. We'll see. Uh, praise you, Lord Jesus. Well, I am, uh, as was said, Dan Nilsson, and, and I'm the new pastor as of last August at, uh, at the Assembly of God Church, which just is a building I have not been in since this was an Assembly of God Church many years ago before they moved up the top of the hill. Thank you. And um, it's so good to be back here. Uh, Brother Steve had called me last week and said, I'd really like to hear your testimony. I think that there's more to it. And there is, and, and I have not shared it really in a long time. But I would start out just with, with uh, having you turn to Psalm 139, if you have your Bible, if you have your app, whatever it is, just get to Psalm 139. <laughs> but I want to just start out by saying this. I grew up in a pastor's home. My father, if you hear Brother Steve talk about Walter Buehler, that was my father's mentor. Uh, he sat under him. Uh, for his years during Bible school, and he was what was called a Butlerite, because that's what they called them, uh, who were just like, you know, he could do no wrong. And I grew up as a little tyke in, in their home. He was a mentor to my father in many different ways over the years. But um, as I began to share at the funeral uh, of our brother Dan a few weeks ago, um, I began to share just a little bit of what had happened to me. I grew up as a pastor's kid, and let me tell you something, I was a rascal. I was the one that, you are like, yep, he's a PK. Because I was getting into trouble every time he turned around. Everything that, if there was ever trouble in the church, they knew where to go. We'll just leave it at that, okay? But something happened when I was about 16 years old, and man, oh man, we had a revival hit our church. And I mean, it wasn't just a little Sunday night, once a, it was done, that was it, kind of revival. This was a revival that changed all of us in so many ways. It was a revival that had 40 to 50 young people on a Sunday night around the altar crying out, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, one in the morning, two in the morning, not wanting to go home. The next day, we had a Christian school there. The next day, the teacher came in, and several of the teachers, and they said, where's all the kids? I said, they're up in the sanctuary. They're going after God. And we canceled classes for a whole week, and it spilled over, and it became month after month. And for about two years, we had this move of God hit our church that changed my life and the trajectory of its take. And then my wife and I have been fortunate enough as adults uh, married adults going, I don't know, close to 40 years now. Uh, we have been fortunate enough to be part of a move of God that happened in the 90s, and it was a sustained move of God for two years. We saw 300 plus people yeah. saved in our church in those couple of years in Batavia, yeah. and we saw God move. And we became God chasers. I think somebody wrote a book called that, yeah. so I can't do it. But uh, yes, Mr. Tenney uh, signed that for me and gave it to me and, and it's sitting on my shelf at home. Uh, but we became God chasers in, this, in such that we decided, you know, we heard about this move of God going on in this place called Pensacola, Florida. Some of you may have heard of what was happening there. Seven times we made this pilgrimage down there and stayed for a week at a time. We were hungry. 
Friday nights, we pack the kids into our minivan and head up to Toronto. And we just want to stay up there and, and just soak in as much as we could and scoot back in on time for preaching at our church on, on uh, Sunday. We became God chasers. But I had one moment in my life, even though I thought I knew what it meant for God to be close to me, I had a moment in my life that forever changed the way that I felt about my relationship with the Lord. How many of you have ever been through a time of testing? that it rocked your faith yeah come on if we're honest it can rock our faith and crisis change us sickness can change us loss of a spouse can change us financial crisis can change us suddenly we find ourselves crying out to god like never before and we pray a little harder when we're on the altar than when we're beside it don't we and our prayers change a little bit Bill Johnson said, casual prayers produce casual results. He says, you pray a lot different when you're on top of that altar. Uh -huh. You know, 1 Corinthians tells us, for now we see what? Through a glass? Darkly. Darkly dimly. We can't really get a clear picture of what's happening. But I had something interesting happen, and just for a moment, God peeled back the curtain and allowed me to see something that I never would have thought possible. And it, it, it was a moment in time and, you know, I wish that somehow God would just pull it back for us all the time. And we'd be able to see, Lord, that's what you're up to. I've always been amazed in, in scripture when that happened. You know, we live in this world where there's, it's, it's two-dimensional in the sense that we're here and I have my body in the spirit realm. Things happen in the spirit realm, but there's this spiritual world which we're not really given much of a glimpse into except for what scripture has to say about it. Do they ever intersect? Do we ever see it? Sometimes it says we've seen angels, we've entertained them unaware. Is there more than just this? He said there must be more. Where's my brother that said that? He said there must be more. We used to sing a song in the 90s just called that. There must be more. Oh, don't remember that. Anyway, <laughs> we used to sing this song. I thought you'd all start singing with me. We used to sing that song. There must be more. And, you know, there, there's this spiritual force of the enemy, we know. Demonic spirits fallen angels, principalities, dominions, powers of the air, but there's these forces of heaven. Yeah. You know, there's the hierarchy of angels. There's Gabriel, the messenger angel, Michael, the archangel, the warrior. We know that Jacob got a glimpse into seeing angels ascending and descending as the father said, go there, go there, go there, go there, go there. They're dispatched. Amen. But we don't get a glimpse of it. I wish I did. I want to see an angel. I've never seen one. I want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob saw it. Moses saw God face to face. All of Israel saw a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day. A donkey even got to see an angel. <laughs> What's the matter with me, Lord? Come on. Joshua got to see an angel. He said, are you for us or against us? Saw the Lord. Shepherds saw multitudes of angels. Some of the disciples saw, saw Jesus transfigured. 500 people saw the risen Savior as he was ascending. Paul had an encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. John saw the risen Savior on the Isle of Patmos. But as we live our lives today, we don't often have encounters that we could say, I saw an angel. We come to church when the Lord said, I must go so that I send my comforter. We know that the Lord's with us, like tonight. How do you know? Oh, how? How do we know he's with us? The word says it. The word says it, okay. 
How do we know that he is here with us tonight when we're singing? Feel, okay? Feel it. We, we sense it. We feel it. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. And all of a sudden we get, you know, I always have spiritual goosebumps. We get like, ooh, he's here. Yeah. Any of you lived through back in the day when, when Catherine Kuhlman would, uh, anybody remember? Uh, a couple, okay. The rest of you are too young. But she would come out and she would go, he's here. And it'd be like, but we sense it, we feel it. Most of our life, we read these stories in Scripture, and by faith, we believe that God's Word, you know, what it says is true. We sense sometimes that we're being led by the Holy Spirit when we feel inside compelled to do something. But not too many have ever had an encounter like the ones we've read about in the Bible. And in, in our darkest hour, what I want to say to you tonight is, in your darkest hour, if you only knew how close the Lord is to you. If you only knew. In 2015, my life changed forever. I had an encounter which forever changed the way that I viewed how God is with me in my life. I've had a lot of close calls. The only ones here that really knew me before was Wes, knew me before I had my accident, and our soundboard, uh, <laughs> Doug, I knew it was Doug, left me for a second. Doug knew me when I led worship at Bethel in Rochester. Uh, and those are the only two that knew me prior to this happening. But on January 30th, 2015, my faith was shaken like never before. I had preached for many years, and I'd always said to everyone, God is with you. He's right with you. He's close beside you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And then in 2015, I was driving after a couple of nights of no sleep. I had not slept. And I was driving. It must have been, I was about on my 1200th mile, somewhere around there. And I was just about back up into Henrietta on 390. And if you know that stretch of road where Henrietta... Uh, 390 and 590 going north split I decided to make a new road right through the middle of it where there's, where there's a guardrail as I dozed off and here's what happened just for a second I was having so much trouble staying awake I dozed off just for one second just in time to see a sign right in front of me so it was like this I dozed off and BAM I hit this sign and I flipped end over end over end down into a ravine. Yeah. And uh, when I got down there, it was about 150 feet off the road. Nobody had seen it happen. It was about midnight. Wow. And nobody knew I was down there. You could not see my car from the road. So I heard cars coming and going. And, and I literally was realized something very quickly, and that is this. I can't move my legs. And I had this searing pain like I've never had before in my back. And I knew right away I had broken my back. And five places actually, um, but one of them, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, was what's called a, if anybody's medical in here, a burst fracture. It just exploded. And it punched into my spinal canal and got my spinal cord. So the bone was pressing right against it. I had zero movement in my legs. No feeling. My phone went somewhere and all that. I don't even know where it ended up. Unable to move. 10 below zero. Nobody saw it happen. And I realized that I would probably perish down there that night. It was snowing hard. And as I was there for one hour, and then two hours, and then three hours, I realized Nobody knows I'm down here. And it began to snow hard. And I knew that pretty quick my car was going to start being buried yeah. in the snow. We got 18 inches of snow that night into the next day. And after hours, literally, I began to lose hope. 
I began, you know, thinking, you hear everybody say, oh, your life flashes before your eyes. I guess in a sense that's true because I still remember everything as it happened in slow motion. I remember the sounds of crunching metal. I remember the smells of engine oil after I came to a rest where I must have ripped the oil pan off the bottom. The terrible sounds the engine was making as it died. I remember the sound of cars going by over top and I began to think about my wife, my kids, my grandkids, thinking that I would likely never see them again. About three hours went by and out of desperation, I cried out. I mean, I yelled it. I said, God, if you don't get me out of here, I'm going to die down here in this place. And I barely got those words out of my mouth. And I heard, is anyone in that car? I'm sorry, Jesus. I don't know if that's a sign. I think Jesus says you're done. Sorry, I, I got to kind of hold on uh, to keep my balance so I may rock this just a little bit. It may happen again. I don't know. But uh, did, are you able to get a picture that I put back there? Just I just had a couple pictures real quick if, if they're able to be pulled up there. Uh, yeah, okay, so first, that was my plan for life on top. <laughs> on the bottom is kind of how it turned out. All right, go ahead. Click through the next one if you would. Uh, if we got them. Got them? Fast forward. Okay. Uh, I still have the thumb drive if you need it. Out of that because I just want everybody to kind of see where I was at and what was happening because I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, it's under a file called transfer. There it is. Never mind. Okay. Well, there we are. So that's my car the next day. Okay. They had to really cut it apart to kind of get me out of there. I didn't have much room to even survive in there. Uh, so this was and if you can you go through the next few too is that possible there we go so there's just part of the news report that was going on next one uh that's just a picture that the news had taken from down below i was down in that if you notice the cattails there i was just about to it uh next one that's uh this is what i was talking about at dan's funeral firefighters that literally cut me out of the car they're cutting my roof off right there trying to figure out how to get me out of that car. Uh, I'm trying to think what's next, but go ahead. Okay, so if you see that top one that circled, see how the rest of them are nice and full, and that one's kind of broken in little pieces. Uh, that one that circled, that's what ended up happening, and go ahead. Uh, this is me now, okay? So that's what's in my back, kind of holding me together, screws and, and whatever, uh, go ahead. Uh, so this was a couple of months after the accident. This was the first time I was going to try standing. I'll just go through these quick and then I'll keep going. Go ahead. That was the very first time. That was like two months post-accident. I'm wearing a brace on my back. I always called it my turtle shell because that's pretty much where I was. Go ahead. All right. First time trying to use a walker. Uh, it was quite the, quite the ride. I think that's probably it. Um, yeah, okay. So there, you kind of know what I was talking about. But the rescue, they had to cut the roof off to be able to get me out. And they're trying to figure out how are we going to lift this guy out? Because I was screaming, literally screaming in pain. I just kept going, oh God. And they thought that I was perhaps taking the name of the Lord in vain, but I was crying out to God, I can't take this pain. So into the trauma unit. I won't go through too much of it, but I remember laying there, scared out of my mind. And I remember asking the doctor 
do you think I'll ever walk again? And he just answered me point blank, no. Not likely was the answer I got. Then came a 10 hour surgery into the ICU. They kept me in a coma for about two weeks just because of the pain. And then after that, into the neurological unit, then the rehab unit, and then onto a rehab center as they were, that was the rehab unit picture as they were trying to get me back up on my feet again. A year of PT three times a week. And the days in the hospital were extremely lonely. They kept me busy, you know, PT three times a day, occupational therapy, all the different stuff, trying to get your mind. They sent psychiatrists in because they know you're going through all kinds of emotional trauma at that time as well. And um, I remember every day, I never blamed God, not once, but every day I wondered why. Did you know it's okay to wonder why, right? That does not mean you're questioning God, you know, saying you don't believe in him, but it's okay to say, Lord, why? Paralyzed in bed. It's amazing how much you need your legs to roll over. I couldn't roll over. They had to do it for me. I couldn't go to the bathroom. They had to do it for me. Nurses had to come and change me because I couldn't go anywhere else. And when you're a guy who's used to doing everything by yourself, that kind of has a tendency to affect you. And I didn't realize it then, but I was going through the stages of grief. You know, the whole denial and the anger and, the, and, and all these things. I was going through them. And then shortly after that, I had the nightmares begin. Okay, so every single time I close my eyes, day or night, as soon as I close my eyes, boom, I just see the accident happen. Close my eyes, bang, I see it happening. Thousands of times a day I was reliving that. I could not close my eyes. I couldn't sleep. I'd wake up in the middle of the night when I finally got home and Karen, if she would get up and go out in the living room or something, uh, I would wake up and she'd be gone and I'd cry literally a grown man, I'd cry and I'd say, honey, where are you? I'd be terrified. In the hospital, often they would have one of the, the techs come in and sit there and hold my hand at night till I fell asleep because I was terrified. I'd be screaming and people would come running in from down the hall because this PTSD, these nightmares became so debilitating. And the climb out of this came really in three steps. Because how many of you know when God does something, a lot of times it's incremental. If he's going to bless you, guess what? He's not going to dump it all on you at once. Right? It would kill us. So little by little by little, God incrementally works in our life. And so here I was about eight months, I'd say or so, after the accident. I was still using a walker. I hadn't gotten to the point where I could use a cane yet. First time I tried it, it fell flat on my face. And they said, not yet. <laughs> walker, arm crutches, eventually the cane. Sometimes I still do use the walker if I'm unsteady. But we went to a service at a church where they were having uh, just some special services. And there's a woman there, some of you may have heard of Barbara Yoder. Uh, if some of you have heard of her, uh, she has Shekinah Ministries, she has Breakthrough Apostolic Ministries as well. And Barbara Yoder was there, and so Karen and I decided to go, and while we were there, we got pointed to and called out, and I just stood up, and we got a prophetic word, not by her, by somebody else, delivered right to us. And I was like, okay, Lord, what are you up to? Been asking him that a lot lately. <laughs> what are you up to? So after the service, we went back. They invited all the pastors and their spouses to come back after the service and just have some refreshments. So we went back and I'm going along with my walker and I sat on the end of the table so I could put my walker aside. And Barbara Yoder comes up and she sat down right next to us and she started talking. 
we began to have this conversation and I saw something going on in her head. As I'm talking, I see her just close her eyes for a minute. And I knew she was hearing something from the Lord. <laughs> she reaches over to me after listening to me and she asked me two questions. She said, number one, she said, I need to ask you this. Has anyone prayed for the spirit of fear to be broken off of you? I said, why no? <laughs> so I expected this, you know, casting out type thing going on and all this, but she just lays her hand on me and she says, in the name of Jesus, spirit of fear, I command you to leave. And that was that. Yeah. For the first time in eight months, I went home and slept. <laughs> and I didn't have the nightmares anymore. I didn't have any more of these problems with this PTSD that was going on. And that prayer broke off of me, a spirit of fear. And, and, and she had, she told me later, she goes, I had an image in my mind of, of your mind, literally with tentacles just wrapped around it. And she goes, that spirit literally had just gotten a hold of you so much during this time when you were open to depression and discouragement. That's the time the enemy comes, right? Yeah, right. When we are at our lowest point is when the enemy comes and he begins to tell you, the Lord's not with you. He's not with you. Look what's happened. He's abandoned you. <sighs> Now, when God does a work in us, <laughs> like I said, he often works in incremental steps. The second step, the question, rather, that she asked me was this. She goes, number one, has anybody prayed for the spirit of fear? Number two, she goes, after talking to me and after praying with me, she goes, I feel the Lord asking me, telling me to ask you, have you forgiven yourself for what happened? Wow. I had never once said, God, this is your fault. I never did. I knew where the blame lay. And so for all that time, I just turned the anger so much towards myself for letting this happen. I remember laying in the in the in the trauma unit that night. And I remember they, they, they wouldn't let even let Karen come in at first, but my wife, but later they let her come in. And the first thing I said to her was, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't know what we're going to do now. How are we going to make it financially? I'm just, I'm so sorry this happened. And I was blaming myself and I didn't realize how much pent up anger I had towards myself for allowing this to happen. And so God... It wasn't like she just laid her hands on me and said, oh, you're, you know, forgive yourself. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I began to ponder it and think about it. And some more time went by. And I was at our house one day. And, and when, I, when I came home from the rehab center, they would not let me come home unless somebody would stay there with me. So my daughter had come over and she would stay most of the day because back then my wife she works from home now, but back then she had to go to work every day. And so someone needed to be there or they weren't going to let me come home. So my daughter would come over every day and she'd help me out with all the things I needed help with. But there came a time usually where there was about an hour between when she had to leave and when my wife would come home. And I remember one day I was sitting in the wheelchair watching the world go by. I'm an outdoorsman, I love to hunt, I love to fish, I love to snowmobile and four-wheeler and on the boat, and that's what I've always loved. And instead, I had to sit in my wheelchair and let my neighbors mow my lawn, and friends came over and planted flowers, and people came over and worked on the house, and somebody even came over and built a deck in back of my house, <laughs> sitting back there, and uh, uh, just, just uh, everyone had to do everything for me. I could not drive yet, <clears throat> everything I loved, and I sat there all day long, and at times I wouldn't speak a word. The whole day I'd just sit there, stare out the window. The Bible seemed not to be speaking to me like it used to. 
my time with the Lord was strained. I had come to the point where I was numb. You ever get that way? You go through a crisis and after a while you just become numb. I was numb. To me, God was distant. And I found myself, this is me now, I've been through two revivals, I've been my whole life, you know, uh, uh, just wanting nothing but chasing after God. And I came to the point where I was like Job. It said in Job 23, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. I go backwards, I can't perceive him. I go to the left, I cannot see him. He turns to the right, but I cannot see him. And that's how I felt. Until one day, I was sitting by myself in the living room. And YouTube was still gaining in popularity, and I turned it on on the TV, and I began to look for something to lift my spirits, and I was scrolling through, and I came to uh, Darlene Check had a video, and she was just singing an old hymn with a modern twist, and it just said, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee, all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. And then these words. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. And I got through the first verse, and I just felt the Lord, as I said those words, Lord, if ever I've loved you, it's right now. It's right now. And I did something I don't ever do. I had not cried since this accident happened. And I started to have tears coming down my eyes as I started singing with her. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. Lord, if ever I've loved thee, my Jesus is now. By now I got snot going all over, but I'm still singing. I love you in life, Lord. I love you in death. And I'll praise you as long as you give me breath. And I'll say when the death dew lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus does not. By the time the song finished, I was bawling like a baby. My shirt was soaking wet. First time I had cried since all this happened. And it just let loose. The dam burst. And I realized at that point that I was having this emotional release that I had been so closed up for so long. When she said, have you forgiven yourself? I was feeling like I can't forgive myself. Look what I've done to my family. But there's more. There's more. You remember Paul Harvey? Anybody remember him? Oh, yeah. What was his saying? And now for? All right, here we go. Psalm 39, <laughs> that was my introduction, I'm kidding. All right, Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, hell, you are there. If I take up wings at dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there, Listen to this. Your hand will lead me. And your right hand, just like with Peter, will take hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Listen to this. Even darkness is not dark. I think Michael W. Smith sang a song like that a few years ago, right? Even the darkness is not dark to the Lord. The night is as bright as the day. My cry became, where are you, God? Lord, where are you in all of this? Okay, Lord, I, I get it. Spirit of fear has gone. I've forgiven myself. But I still don't see where you are in all this. Where are you became... I cry. 
You remember in Luke 18, the woman that kept coming to the unjust judge and kept knocking and knocking, and he was like, oh, it's this woman again, all right? And he said, go away, and the next night, and the next night, and the next night. Finally, he's like, if I don't answer this prayer. What's an interesting part, Luke 18, verse 8 says, won't justice or won't the answer come quickly? Well, I, I don't understand that for a minute because it said the answer comes quickly. But here's this woman knocking, no answer. Knocking, no answer. Knocking, she keeps knocking, no answer, no answer. This was me. God, where are you? God, where are you? Lord, I don't understand where you are in all this. That was me. But let me tell you something. The Bible says when the answer comes, it comes quickly. That doesn't mean as soon as we pray, bang. That means when it happens, it's going to happen quick. It did. <laughs> I'm saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? God, where are you? I had a particularly bad day when I was saying, God, where are you? My wife came home from work. She looked at me and she goes, bad day? She could tell. I said, yeah, it's hard. She goes, well, I got something to tell you. She said, this woman, uh, my wife is a caseworker for people with developmental disabilities, and so she gets to know the families that are on her caseload. Right. And she came home with me and she said, listen, this woman today, how many of you have ever had somebody come up to you and say something, God told them a word for you, and you're like, yeah, well, praise the Lord, that's good. <laughs> Honestly, come on. Yeah. Have you ever done that? All right. And so my wife comes home and she goes, this woman named Kathy came today. She, she and I were talking as I was visiting. And now I want you to know something. I got to preface this. I've never met this woman. She's never met me. We don't know each other. All she knows is a few things that my wife has told her about me and what we're going through. She goes, well, Kathy came to me today. And she said to tell you that she had a dream about you last night. And I'm like, well, praise the Lord, you know, let's hear this. So she begins to tell me this dream. She goes, in this dream, she saw you down in the ravine in your car trapped. And you were crying out, God, where are you? If you don't rescue me, I'm going to die. And she goes, while you were down there, she goes, she saw Jesus standing right at the top where all those emergency vehicles are with his hand stretched out like this over you. And I'm like, well, praise the Lord. That's great. That's wonderful. That's nice. Tell her thank you. I don't know what to think of it. But listen. While she's telling me, that, remember I said when the answer comes, it comes quick? Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, the kids, I, I said this last week in church, the kids play in the water park, our grandkids, and they have this thing where there's a stream that is filling a bucket, right? And the bucket gets fuller and fuller and fuller, and it begins to slowly tip, and then all of a sudden, just quickly, just whoosh. And it's just douses them. Well, that's what happened. All right. So I'm listening to Kat. You know, the, the, she had a dream, and and she, you were, you know, in your car, and Jesus was standing there with his arm stretched over you. And this woman lived in Rochester, and uh, you know, I've never met her before. And praise the Lord, that's good. And while she's telling me this, my phone rings, and I see that's a Batavia number. The only people I know in Batavia are people from our old church, and honestly, we have been gone 20 years. I didn't really keep in touch with very many people over there, and I, I knew it was a Batavia number, so I figured, well, I better answer it. Who knows who it'll be? So she's telling me this. She's just finishing it up. Saw Jesus standing there, this Kathy. And then, while 
that is going on. I don't know. This, oh, it's still on. Okay. Must have turned it down really loud. Okay. So while that was going on, I get a phone call and I'm like, hello? Pastor Dan? Yeah? Trying to figure out who the voice is on the other end. I don't know if you remember me, but when you were pastoring in Batavia, she goes, first of all, she goes, my name's Kathy. I don't know if you remember me, but she goes, I've really debated calling you all day. And she goes, I finally just felt I had to. She goes, I don't want you to think I'm weird, but last night I had a dream. Second Kathy, they don't know each other from Adam. They're different towns, different cities. Second Kathy calls up right when this other one, my wife was finishing the story and said, she goes, last night I had a dream and I saw you down in your car. And she said, <laughs> she said, I looked and I saw you down there and I saw Jesus standing up top with his arms stretched out over top of you <laughs> as if he was praying. And I, <laughs> Two Kathy, same night, same dream. I think God was trying to answer, where are you? When I was questioning, where was God? But we're not done. <laughs> As the call was finishing up, I see a third call come in on my phone. It's not a Kathy, it's, it's a daddy. My dad called and he goes, you know, and keep in mind, this is like eight months after my accident said, uh, I've been debating calling you for a while because he goes, I just wanted to wait for the right time. And he goes, I, I think it's the right time. <laughs> because I literally had to say to the one Kathy, hey, Kathy, my dad's calling me. Can I? And he goes, the night you had your accident, he goes, I couldn't sleep. He goes, I was, they live in Tennessee. They're retired pastors down there and uh, he goes I just couldn't sleep I, it was like I woke up and I was all unsettled inside and he goes I just sensed inside that I needed to pray he goes so I went out to my recliner and I sat there in my recliner and the Bible says when we don't know how to pray how are we to pray spirit so he begins to pray in the spirit. And as he goes, he goes, I prayed for about 20 minutes, just constantly praying in the spirit. And he said, when that 20 minutes let up, he goes, I was like, oh, you know, your insides start to hurt. And he goes, maybe I can go to bed. And then I hit him again. And then he prays for another 20 minutes and he's praying in the spirit. He's praying in the spirit. And he begins, as soon as he gets done, he goes, I went back in the bedroom to lay down and the phone rang and it was my wife saying, Dad, Dan's been in a terrible accident. He said, he said, I think I was praying for God to save your life that night. I, I had been asking God for eight months, God, where are you? Lord, where are you? I don't understand any of this. And the answer comes quick. <laughs> and in a matter of 10 minutes, the Lord told me, I was right with you. You weren't alone. I was right there. I think the Lord had me come here tonight for one reason. And that's this, to tell you that whatever you're walking through, the enemy is right there beside you, whispering in your ear, do you see what's happened? He's left you. Do you see what you get for serving God? Look what he's allowed you to go through, the sickness. Look what he's allowed you to go through, the loss of a spouse. Look what he's allowed you to go through. He doesn't love you. I would say these things to my wife at night. I wouldn't blame God, but I would express my frustration when she would work all day and then come and stay till the closing of visiting hours at Strong as I was in there for four months. And she would come every night and then the rehab center and just stay with me. And at times I would say to her, honey, I don't think I can do this anymore. I can't do this. 
I can't do this anymore. And she would get so angry, not at me, but at the devil. And she would go home and she would just say the same phrase over and over again. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a liar. Because he was trying to speak lies because out of him comes no truth whatsoever. Everything that he says is contrary to scripture. And the Lord, if he sent me to say one thing to tell you tonight, it's this. The answer is coming. The answer is coming. You may not have it yet, but I'm telling you, when it comes, it's going to come quick. When I was there, paralyzed, freezing, near death, they had to use a bear hugger in the hospital to circulate warm air around me to try to get my core temperature up. They couldn't even get needles in me because my skin was so hard and cold. And there was Jesus, standing with his arms stretched over me, saying, Father, you see Dan? Would you save him? Yeah. And all the while I had a father praying for me at that very minute in the spirit that the Lord would intercede and save my life. Interesting thing, and I'll, I'll close. As I was down there that night and I cried out to the Lord, people had been driving by all night up above on 390, they had been going by. I could hear the cars. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them. I found out pretty quick they couldn't hear me when I tried yelling. It's like, no help. Nobody can't hear you when they're driving their cars. 60 miles an hour going by. As I called later, the 911 center, I, they wouldn't give me the info. I went to Brighton Ambulance. I stopped in one night, one day on my way by, and I just wanted to stop in and say thank you. And I said, is there any way you could put me in touch with whoever called 911 that night and whoever rescued me? And they did. They had to call them first to make sure it was okay. And I talked to them, and they said this. They said, a uh, husband drove tow truck and he got a call that night and usually the wife doesn't go with him, but it was late at night and she just said, I, I'm going to go ride with you. It was snowing hard, you know, so they were going by and if you know that stretch of road right yeah. below that goes South Clinton Ave. Yeah. And they're driving on South Clinton Ave going where the underpass where, where <laughs> I went over. And at just the right moment as they were driving by, the wife looked out the window and said, hey, there's a car up there. And oh. said, I think we should turn around. And the husband said, oh, come on, I got to get to this call. And she goes, no, can we just turn around for a minute? And they told me that they had come very close to not turning around. Here's what I believe. As the Lord was standing there, I think he just reached his hand over and went, <laughs> and brought them back. Because he was standing right there. <laughs> Listen to me. I just want you to know, whatever you are going through, whatever you're walking through, I want you to know the answer is coming, and it's coming quickly. All right? Whatever you're walking through, it's coming. The answer is coming. What is our job? Our job is just keep believing. Yeah. Our job is to keep worshiping. I didn't get to see an angel, but I got the next best thing. The Lord pulled back the spiritual curtain to two ladies named Kathy <laughs> in the same night. <laughs> at the same time with them and gave them a dream to pass along to me. Yeah. So he sends me tonight to pass along to you. You are not 
Oh, well, uh, he's right here. Brother Steve, I'm going to pass this back over to you, my friend. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Wes has some things that he would like to share. I don't know where I can so be sturdy. Wasn't that a powerful message? Yeah, yeah. That's, great. that's one you'll want to hear again. I'm glad we have that video. We'll be able to share that again and again and again. Listen to it again and again. Powerful. Thank you for sharing your heart. It truly was a remarkable story, but the passion that you're sharing and the message behind it was even greater than even the story itself. So thank you so very much. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know how I don't get through this. Uh, I was in an AG church over in Canada and I know Dan 20 plus years or better broke bread with him and stuff. And we heard about the accident. We had prayer and such. And in 96, I had been in a near fatal car wreck myself. Uh, my van, my daughter was driving my van, threw me out the front window, and the van rolled over on top of me a couple times. It broke everything from here to here. Uh, Shred my liver, punctured my lungs, blah, blah, blah. But anyway. Yeah. I say all that to, I never experienced a lot of that loneliness type of thing. But anyway, so we heard about Dan and the car wreck and we prayed, we had prayer service at church and stuff. And I like, yeah, okay, hey amen, we'll pray for Dan, we'll pray for Dan. And I prayed for him different times, but I never pressed in for prayer for him. Like, now I know that I should have. Yeah. I did. Several months ago, probably early in the spring, I had a yearning in my heart to know where Dan was, what was Dan doing. And he was on my mind a lot. <laughs> and then over to Walt's one night with the prayer service, he says, yeah, we got a new pastor. He says, his name Dan. I said, his name Dan Nielsen. He said, yes. And my spirit left <laughs> when I heard that. I had been looking for him, not real hard. <laughs> I know where he lives. I drive by his house a bunch of times. And, uh, but um, there, there is something more with him being here tonight, telling the story. God is wanting to do something with somebody. Uh, he is, it's, it's crazy. Like I said, for months and months of like, Dan was always on my heart and I'd be praying for him or whatever. And then come to find out he's right here in Newark. I live in Canada, but I come to Newark to church. And it's no coincidence that he's, that we, we got connected again unofficially <laughs> but I just want to say that he says when you're alone don't ever think you're alone true but remember also there is more to come there's more to come uh, his legs because of the broken back and things uh, most everything healed up on me except my shoulder it don't work real good but so be it but out of all of these things, God has made a divine connection in this house. Mm -hmm. And we started coming last January. We should begin to have the services. And there were some powerful services all through January, February, through the, the spring and stuff. And there still is. I mean, they're, they're still powerful. But it, it's, I just had to, I just had to say that Reconnecting with Dan, I did my spirit leap. I said, yes. And our old pastor, I saw him about a month or so ago, and I was like, you won't believe who I saw. I saw Dan Nielsen. He's over in Newark. Right, right, right. I said, yes, yes. I got to connect back 
uh, I, I don't, I don't know where it's going to go, uh, but I sure would like to be on his coattails whenever he goes again. <laughs> uh, but like I said, I should have prayed more, but you know, well, for whatever reason, I, I don't know. I didn't. There were times I did press in, but there were times that I didn't. And you had two Kathy's. So, <laughs> but anyway, I say all that to say this that uh, Dan came here tonight, and it is not a coincidence. And uh, Amen. for me to have back in touch with him again after these many years, that there there is a connection, there is a there is a something that God is doing amongst these people, and sometimes He uses the old, and sometimes He uses the cripple. <laughs> and, the, and the young, oh, and and the young, the, 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 the young. Yes, the young. So, there you go. Yeah. Let's sing one more song, okay? Let's go out in victory tonight. One yes. song, Stephanie. Where art thou? Cynthia. 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 She's been gone so long, I forgot her name. <laughs> Cynthia. She sang one of Stephanie's songs tonight. I don't go by anything. She says the echo voice. Yeah. Does it sound like Jesus? I did hear God's voice once, and it was a woman. I did. There's, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. What a great, great testimony. I'm so glad I was here tonight to hear that. Yeah. I mean, just beautiful. And, and through it all, you can stand on the other side of it and say, It is well with my soul. Right? Wow. It is well. I bet you didn't feel like it at the moment, right? But now you know. And just seeing that picture of Jesus with his arms stretched out. I mean, how beautiful is that? Yeah. And no matter what we're going through, no matter what our circumstance, no matter what's going on in our body, our relationships, our our house, our finances, no matter what, we can say it is well with our soul. And why? Because we know that he never leaves, right? When peace like a
God good. Father, we just thank you so much for just showing up. Whenever your people show up, you just seem to show up too, and that's just wonderful. We praise you for that, God. Lord, we praise you, Father, for all the good things that we heard tonight, Lord. The reminders that, God, you never leave us or forsake us, just like your word says. Father, we thank you, Lord, that, that God, in whatever our circumstances, Lord, we know that, that Lord, you're at work in our behalf. We praise you for that, God. We rejoice in you, God. Lord, tonight as we close, as we go to our homes, Lord, we pray, Father, upon the blessings upon every person here, Lord. God, that maybe things have been reignited, that your fire has been reignited in our soul in some way, Lord. We pray to God that you would let that work of refinement, that work of reconciliation, that work of, of building up and edifying, Lord, let that have its way in our lives, Lord. Until we meet again, we praise you and we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.